Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guests today are Goldman Sachs co-heads of the Office of Applied Innovation, Jared Cohen and George Lee. Jared also serves as the company's president of global affairs. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Jared Cohen, George Lee, great to speak with you both uh, today. Thank you so much for making time with me. Happy to be here. Always great to see you, Peter. Likewise, thank you. Uh, George, let's begin with you. Uh, you've had this remarkable career across uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, uh, across multiple decades. You've you've led global technology, media, and telecom banking. Uh, you've been the co-CIO of the company, a role you had for four years. And then a little less than a year ago, Jared and you uh, christened this Office of Applied Innovation. And I wonder if you could take a moment to talk about the mission of it, as well as a bit of a definition of applied innovation. Great. Thank you. Yep. This has been a really exciting new chapter. And I think in many ways, it it represents an opportunity to leverage the accumulation of all the experiences I've had over 28 plus plus years at the firm. The mission of the Office of Applied Innovation is to really drive innovation at the intersection of markets, technology, and geopolitics to create differentiated output and thought leadership for our clients. Parenthetically, We also hope to leverage those activities to discern opportunities to build new businesses inside Goldman Sachs, or perhaps more likely outside the four walls of Goldman Sachs that kind of are reflective of the trends that we identify and leverage new directions the world, the world's evolving in. Equally important to the sort of articulation of our mission is the context of why now. You know, I think that 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 context is in some respects the the raison d'etre behind this in 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 the first place. And so, like if you if you reflect back to the couple of decades before 2020, you had an interesting trend where technology was shaping geopolitics and geopolitics was shaping technology, but that nexus wasn't rattling the markets. And so, as a result, unless you were a tech company, the broad business community was largely insulated from geopolitics, right? You know, it touched some businesses and it wasn't irrelevant, but it wasn't a dominant feature in how you thought about your 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 business. And if you think about that story and reflect on it, by the way, in the US's perspective, that, that wasn't a great chapter because they, they had a three decade first mover advantage in the connectivity race and it basically ended in a tie with China. And, you know, furthermore, like if you reflect back to before COVID, the observation would have been that it seemed like democratic societies were having a harder time dealing with the challenges of being open than more closed societies were dealing with the complexity associated with being closed. And, you know, to go a step further, you talk to people in the AI space back then, AI was getting boring. There was a lot of hyperbole around crypto threatening the dollar. None of these things ended up being true. So you fast forward to today, which gets to the point about why now every single business in every single geography in every single sector is almost completely consumed by the macro trends associated with geopolitics and technology separately and together. And so you'd be hard pressed to find a business that's not caught in the crossfire of a lot of these dynamics. And so you look at a place like Goldman Sachs, you know, our clients cover everyone you can possibly imagine. We have both a responsibility to our clients, not to mention they have an expectation of us that we will be innovative in these areas. And innovation does not equal technology. Innovation equals differentiation. And so, you know, George and I have come together to build this Office of Applied Innovation to really lean into the trends that we feel like we're very well positioned to work with our clients, both as an intellectual partner on as well as a commercial partner. So, so this was something that came about both in terms of your own thought process, but very much demand from the outside as well, kind of a recognition of the changing landscape, but also a growing appetite among clients for this sort of advice as well. Is that is that fair? Definitely. I mean, one of the things I hear from my colleagues in investment banking is that CEO level and board level meetings often start with questions about two or three things in the world that that are kind of unique to the last couple of years. One is just, again, geopolitics in the forefront and CEOs and boards and companies trying to understand how that will impact their businesses globally. Second is the rise of things like artificial intelligence and how they ought to think about how that will influence their business. And so those sort of macro factors have begun to predominate in these dialogues. And so being able to deliver differentiated perspectives around that is enormously helpful to all of our clients. And you know, you asked, what does innovation mean to us? You know, I think there's a tendency to attach innovation really solely to technology. And of course, you know, we're focused on technology innovation, but to us, 
Innovation is about differentiation for our clients, just as Jared was talking about. So it's it's not only about new technology platforms and ventures, it's about new ideas and new insights at that intersection I described that I think can be can be very powerful and help allow the firm to serve its clients better and more insightfully. Yeah, that makes sense. Jared, in addition to being the co-head of Office of Applied uh, Innovation with George, you're the president of Global Affairs. Can you talk a bit about that side of your set of responsibilities and what that entails, please? Yeah, the, the, the president of Global Affairs role is, think, think of it as the front end of this for the geopolitics. I've built a career engaging with, with leaders in you know every geography and, and, and forged really close relationships with them. As president of Global Affairs, I invest a lot in those relationships in terms of not just understanding what leaders of countries are seeing in terms of geopolitical trends, but you know, also really understanding what their aspirations and ambitions are for their country, for their region. Nobody has a crystal ball for where geopolitics is going. And I would say that geopolitics right now is at probably the most uncertain moment that we've seen in two decades. It's kind of the one thing that every leader I talk to agrees upon. I mean, on the surface, that uncertainty is so easily attributed to escalating tensions between the US and China and a war in Ukraine. But but that's what we see on the surface. Part of the reason you're seeing such a sort of seismic shift in geopolitics that's rattling the markets is you know, we're really on the precipice of a new chapter of globalization. And over the next decade, I think we're about to witness a once in a generation reorientation of global supply chains. And by the way, the first massive reorientation of supply chains since globalization reached its its partial zenith. We're also witnessing with that a complete reorientation of how capital flows and the implications of where capital comes from and where capital ends up. And then third, I think we're also seeing not just with the advent of technology, but with these tensions between the US and China and the war in Ukraine, we're seeing heightened conversation about what it means to live in the dollar economy going forward. And this is something I hear from so many different countries around the world. I'm not hearing a rejection of the fact that they're going to continue living in a dollar economy. What I'm hearing is an aspiration to exist within a dollar economy with more autonomy, and that manifests itself in different ways in different geographies. Very interesting. You've also noted uh, the importance of geopolitical swing states, Jared, including uh, not only in past conversations you and I have had, but also in in recent writing as well. And and I wonder if you could talk a bit about what is meant by that and some examples of of the, the power that they wield. Yeah, of course. Look, it's so easy to focus on the pitfalls of a major geopolitical tension like the United States and China. And I think it's important to note, I I reject the notion that this is Cold War II or a new version of the Cold War. It actually has very few of the foundational attributes, right? First of all, the the two economies are completely intertwined in a way that the US and the Soviet Union never were. Second, it doesn't have the same ideological component. And third, neither side is trying to destroy the other side, which was the case during the Cold War. And so I view this much more as a kind of you know asymmetric competitive coexistence that's going to get worse for longer. And if that's the case, both sides are going to need other countries in order to gain the upper edge. And so the question is, if you have this at least short and medium term predictable context of US-China tensions getting more problematic, are there countries that benefit from that and have leverage in that? That brings me to the geopolitical swing states. These are basically relatively stable countries that have their own global agendas that are independent of Beijing and Washington, D.C., but they possess a particular economic leverage that empowers them to swing on an issue by issue basis, right? This is how you end up with India, you know, neutral on Ukraine, but aligned with the US on China. These these countries will practice multi-alignment more than kind of non-alignment where you opt out, but they have the luxury of not having to be all in on one country or another. So the question is, what what are those special economic attributes that empower a country to behave like a geopolitical swing state? I mean, there's sort of four non-mutually exclusive categories. The first is they have a differentiated part of the supply chain, and that can be the Gulf with energy resources and food nutrients. It can be Brazil with agricultural commodities and and a growing service industry. You know, it can be India with pharmaceuticals and low-cost labor. It can be Indonesia, which has 22% of the world's nickel. It can be Chile, which has 26% of the world's lithium. The list goes on. 
Second category is countries that have managed to make themselves attractive for nearshoring, offshoring, and friendshoring. So Vietnam is a good example of this. You know, they surpassed the United States' seventh largest trading partner. They surpassed the UK. That's a surprising thing to a lot of people. So that gives them some leverage, particularly given the neighborhood they live in. Third is countries that have a differentiated amount of capital and a willingness and ability to deploy it around the world. So the Gulf countries, they're looking around the world, Latin America and Asia, and they're seeing growing reticence about taking Chinese capital and they're filling that gap. They're seeing Western capital retreat from China, where they're still seeing a lot of opportunities, and they're deploying their capital to fill that gap. Norway is deploying its capital to push an environmental and sustainability agenda, and Singapore is deploying the capital that they have to continue to occupy this hedged middle space between the US and China, because they often say we don't have the luxury of saying something different to China that we say to the United States. And then the fourth category are countries that they're developed nations, but they're led by individuals that have a global vision for the country. So Germany and France, but they are constrained by multilateral bodies that they're part of. The reason I think the geopolitical swing states construct is important is we are talking about these deeply, deeply unpredictable and uncertain geopolitical times. And for businesses who are looking for predictability amidst macro unpredictability, the geopolitical swing states from, from our perspective are pretty useful GPS coordinates for where they may want to pay attention. Very interesting. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit further. You've already uh, mentioned for a good reason, the co-opetition, if you will, <laughs> and growing competition, if not much more than that, between China and the US. And, and you offered some really interesting, Jared, differences between the current situation and the Cold War, despite the fact that many like to frame it that way, which is an important difference. But you also highlighted the fact that it's going to get worse longer. And, and I wonder, you know, as you, from where we stand, at least now, how do you see it evolving, especially in light of some of what you just described in terms of the necessity for China and the U.S. to exert influence on these geopolitical swing states, the progress that each is making, as well as a variety of other factors that come into play as to uh, the, the nature of the, the growing competition. Uh, yeah. What, what, what's sort of the lay of the land from that perspective? Yeah, I'll offer an observation and, and then kind of a prescription, which I think is more productive, because I think there's a habit for those of us in the geopolitical space. We like to complain about a lot of things and diagnose chaos, but then not offer anything prescriptive. And I have a sort of principle that I will only do both at the same time. So look, the observation is part of the reason for these tensions is if you look at the US and China, they're two of the biggest winners from you know a multi-decade chapter of hyper-globalization. And as everyone kind of emerged, you know, as COVID sort of revealed, as the war in Ukraine revealed, neither country is really particularly happy with the outcome, right? So from China's perspective, the U.S. is leaning into its privileged position with the dollar. From the U.S.'s perspective, China's leaning into its privileged position, owning such a diverse array of the world's supply chains. And so, you know, there's a little bit of kind of on both sides, like, how did we get here? And we are where we are, right? That coupled with the fact that domestic politics drives geopolitics, and geopolitics are driving the economic interests of both countries. So historically, in the last chapter, what kept things from boiling over is for both the United States and China, their economic interests were driving the geopolitics, and now it's the other way around. So you have both countries are deeply capable of making very complex economic decisions because the geopolitics pushes them in that direction. And if you look at what's happening domestically in both countries in the U.S., we're in the earliest stage of a presidential election. So that's two years plus whether you have a reelected administration or a new one, they're going to have to kind of prove their protectionist credentials. And, and the most bipartisan issue in the United States right now, besides the sky is blue, is, is taking this tough posture on China. Uh, on the China side, right, you know, they're coming out of the zero COVID policy and high priority for economic growth. That's very much tied to where the domestic demand is right now. And so both both countries are paying very close attention to their domestic populace. That domestic populace is sort of fueling an agenda because China is focused on economic growth right now. You're starting to see them actually try to turn the temperature down. On the geopolitics, the challenge you have in the United States is even if the executive branch reciprocates, we're a three branch system of government and, and one of the other branches, the legislative branch can kind of act independently of, of the executive branch on, on this. And so that complicates things. The prescription on this, though, is as follows. The good news is neither China nor the United States, nobody's making the case for total decoupling and nobody sees the feasibility of that. The prescription is 
we can't just talk about the attributes of what needs to be selectively decoupled. There's a huge part of the economy that will remain integrated, that should remain integrated, and more needs to be done to define what that space looks like. It's kind of like the ultimate public-private intellectual partnership to offer a framework for what the aspects are of the commercial ecosystem that don't belong parked in the geopolitical conversation. Interesting. I appreciate you sharing those perspectives as well as that prescription for going forward. Very important to, have, to, to bear both of those in mind, as you point out, Jared. George, I want to turn to you and, and talk about uh, generative artificial intelligence, generative AI, which one of the things I find so fascinating about it is you know, artificial intelligence has been in the milieu for quite some time, but it's been primarily viewed as a tech-centric discipline and set of capabilities that are arising. And generative AI is in some ways, like the introduction of the iPhone, it's making it accessible to people who are non-technologists in some profound ways. And so I'm seeing uh, you know, a number of uh, leaders of, of organizations who are not at all technical, who are deeply curious and worried about it in ways that perhaps they've not you know, engaged because, because of the level of engagement they've had um, different from, from past engagement with artificial intelligence. Talk a bit about your own perspective. Here are still only about six months into uh, or since the release of ChatGPT 3.5 uh, from OpenAI. What, what's, your, what's your read of the lay of the land there? You're right that the attention to this novel form of artificial intelligence sort of belies the fact that this has been an 80, 70 to 80 year phenomenon. And so I've heard people talk about it being a 70 year overnight success. I think the things that have changed are are two things that have really captured the public attention. And Peter, you, you referenced a couple of them. One is this ability to open a direct interface where humans can engage with machines with a form of machine intelligence as a direct interlocutor. I think that is really different, definitely democratizes this phenomenon. And uh, I think accounts for the rapid rise and proliferation. We've all seen the charts that suggest this is the most quickly adopted technology in history of technologies. I think that is um, capturing people's attention. The second feature of it, I think that's startling is the emergent quality of the dialogue or the answers that you get from the machine. We're used to technology where we write code with branching logic that leads to a deterministic outcome or output. And this idea that we ask and answer questions that have been prohibitively difficult in the past and get an unexpected answer out, something that seems to be a representation of human creativity I think that really accounts for the uh, the enormous amount of attention to it. And then probably third, it's the range of applications and areas that this technology can affect. And so the ability to dream about the influence this technology can have on almost every business, every workflow, every dimensions of geopolitics and politics itself, it's the interface it's the emergent quality and it's this breadth and generality of influence that is startling to people. As I noted, George, people are equal parts curious and interested as they are also worried based upon this. And I wonder where do you sit on that continuum uh, or how are you processing both the good and the potential bad that might be wrought from it? Absolutely. It's also fascinating. I guess it was one of the other factors, just that fan out of attitudes about this, which range all the way from the AI Doomer thesis that we're going to have a short runway, hard takeoff, and this is going to achieve AGI very rapidly. The impact of a superior intelligence in our world will be inherently negative for humanity. That ranges all the way down to on the other side of the spectrum. Look, it's just a chat bot. What's everyone so worried about? I tend to be, as in most things, somewhere in the middle. I think it's deeply influential. I think there are elements of AI alignment that we need to be really concerned about and be ahead of. But my own personal perspective that for some interval here, and it could be five years, it could be 25 years, it could be 50 years, this technology will create a golden era of human creativity and productivity. This ability to use this technology as a co-pilot, which is a bit of a branded term, an omnipresent and omniscient tutor, a learning companion, a counterparty to brainstorm and develop new ideas with. I think the power of this technology coupled with the inherent and enduring strengths of humanity, I think will lead us to remarkable leaps. One thesis that it is at this conjunction of geopolitics and 
technology, specifically AI, is a thesis we call scale up, scale down. In the early going of this generative AI revolution, the trajectory and the, the modality was more data, more parameters, more compute, uh, you know, exemplified by the trajectory of GP2 to GP3 to GPT4, et cetera. What we've seen more recently is the ability to scale down models, which is to provide nearly similar results with more salient domain-specific data sets, lower parameter counts, leveraging some technological approaches like LoRa and other things to drive almost equal capability on models that are much smaller and then can be run almost locally on laptops and PCs, et cetera. And I think there's a really actually very big industry structure and geopolitical impact to that is in the former case, you might have had a small number of very large companies being, being almost you know, hegemonic dominance in this area that has good and bad artifacts. One of the good artifacts is like it's easier to regulate and to keep track of what's going on there. The scale down phenomenon where individual actors can harness the capability of this machine on a disconnected laptop, I think creates a much harder platform to regulate because the innovation and the capabilities are going to be far more distributed. It also confers the ability of bad actors to leverage these technologies at scale in a way that may have been more difficult with the big platforms. And, you know, our researchers on our team have shown us some dramatic demos about the ability to run compelling generative AI experiences on current day laptops disconnected from the internet. And I think, you know, you extend that scale down trend, and I think it just makes it much harder for the world to constrain and get our arms around this this phenomenon. And therefore, I think it creates a lot of geopolitical and political challenge for governments and for governments in cooperation to manage these technologies. And you've also highlighted in past conversations we've had, George, that we're going to see a change of the sort of B2B SaaS companies' models as a result of some of what you've described as well. Talk a little bit further about that, if you would. Yeah, two things. First of all, as as you and I have discussed, I think one of the unanswered questions is, what is the B2B SaaS company of the future, given this technology? We think about a lot of what B2B SaaS companies do is they channel human activity in a way that channels it into workflows that take vast amounts of unstructured data and lend structure to it such that you can inspect it, query it, and make decisions with it. One of the things that these technologies excel at is taking broad, unstructured data, bringing meaning and structure to that data, and allowing you to directly ask and answer questions with that broad context. And so the question remains like, how much will you get paid for structuring workflows in the future way or where it may be less valuable? I think that's a thesis. It's not a proven proposition, but I think it's a fair question to ask. We recently co-hosted an AI conference with our friends at SV Angel just this last Monday, and we had Bill Gates as a speaker. He was interviewed by Patrick Collison of Stripe, and he posited a really interesting theory, which Patrick asked him, who will be the winner, the dominant kingmaker in this industry? Will it be a large company or an as yet unknown startup? And Bill interestingly said, I'm not sure. I think it's a 50-50 proposition, but I know one thing, which is the company that creates the fully effective personal AI agent will be a substantial winner here. And they will essentially render much less relevant the search and personal productivity markets. So you think about there's essentially trillions of dollars of market cap embedded in those two marketplaces. And his view is that the company that creates the great personalized AI agent will erase or co-opt an enormous amount of that market cap. So it's a fascinating perspective. All the more fascinating since he has a dog in the hunt, George. Uh, he's in he, a way, in a way, st- still has an uh, affiliation with one of the companies that is one of the behemoths that's made these this enormous play in perhaps the technology that is struck first and has emerged as one of the large platform leaders. He's very proud of Microsoft's leadership in that area, but it was it was a rather provocative comment. Yeah, very interesting. Well, J- Jared, actually, in light of of this conversation, something you've noted in past conversations we've had is technology is evolving faster than the political architecture can keep up with. And and I think it's a really interesting aspect of contemplating the future of this. What what do you see as the role that government regulation should play in helping or hindering the progress of this? 
Yeah, look, I like to always re- reflect on where we came from to forecast where we're going. And I, I remember you know, when, when Eric Schmidt and I wrote a book called The New Digital Age back in 2013, around then, I think we started off the book with an observation that the internet is the greatest thing that human beings have built that they don't fully understand. We described it as the greatest experiment in anarchy the world has ever known. And I've watched trend after trend, whether it is kind of the previous chapter of AI, you know, the crypto craze, the 5G. I've watched all these things emerge, you know, quantum computing, and none of them have made me change my tune on that line until basically like six months ago. I can't attribute this one to Eric and me, but I think I can attribute it to George and me, unless George disagrees. I I now think that generative AI is the greatest thing that human beings have built that they don't fully understand and potentially the greatest experiment in anarchy the world has ever seen, which means it's the most significant technological change since the invention of the internet. The reason I say that is if you look at what the internet did, it changed our sense of identity and who we are. It changed the way we move resources and value around. It changed the way we connect to each other. It changed the way we consume information. It, it did everything except change our DNA. It changed the world we live in in the sense that we split our time between physical and digital worlds. So it's it did all of those things. And George and I believe that generative AI is going to have a similar impact. What's different this time is the pace of the internet was fast, but it wasn't so fast that the applied use cases couldn't keep up with it. The technology was sort of moving faster than the use cases, but but as there were advancements, you could see the implications of it, which made it much easier to figure out how to control and, and regulate it. The pace of this is, is unlike anything that any of us have ever seen before. And it's happening so fast that we don't even really have the bandwidth to reflect on like why we're doing this. We don't have the bandwidth to you know, really kind of imagine the positive and negative implications. It's just a matter of keeping up. And then separately, there's two different conversations happening. There's a highly technical conversation about your race to see who has the best large language model. And then there's a separate scramble over, given there's plenty of models that are out there right now that are good enough, how do we apply them today? And by the way, you know, I'm, I'm saying that in a, in a positive affirmative context, there's people who are asking that same question for, for more nefarious purposes. This is also an area that kind of exemplifies this crossover and the union of Jared, my background and interests you think about a technology with this much power and the pace of emergence, it's super consequential to issues of national competitiveness. It's consequential to matters of national sovereignty. You know, imagine the concern and effect to more totalitarian authoritarian regimes with respect to a technology that doesn't offer deterministic outputs, but rather emergent outputs and answers that are not controllable or may not be consistent with government doctrine. So I think that's fascinating. And then finally, think about the impact of these technologies on matters like market integrity, the rise of deep fake technology, the ability to simulate voices and images of important people. By the way, there was just one in the news recently where a deep fake of a fire at the Pentagon influenced the stock market pretty dramatically earlier this week. And so, um, look, this is going to have very significant geopolitical implications and will be fascinating to watch that. It'll also be fascinating to see the degree to which nations can cooperate around some form of governance, regulation, and oversight. Uh, as this technology develops. And uh, I think it will challenge the ability of the world to cooperate at a time, as Jared's described, where that's just more strained. The only thing that I would add, because it's a critical component of what we're doing uh, in the Office of Applied Innovation, is if you look at all this new technology, historically, we've focused a lot on technology applied to the unregulated parts of the economy. But for one, I think the regulated umbrella is going to grow over time. But if you look at all this technology, I mean, look, there's tons of pain points and inefficiencies in the regulated economy across a lot of different sectors, right? You know, the financial sector is not the only sector that's regulated. And when you start thinking about innovation in a regulated ecosystem, the sequence is a little bit different. It becomes less about what's the problem that you're trying to solve and what's the technology that you're going to build. And it becomes more about how do you architect a company that at a later stage can adopt technology to address one of those pain points. And so you look at a place like Goldman Sachs and you know, with all of our controls and regulatory infrastructure, we really understand what works and what doesn't work in the regulated economy. The technology, in some respects, that's been being taken care of elsewhere. 
And so we're spending a lot of time thinking about, can we sort of take what we do just to kind of govern our own business? And can we apply that knowledge to new businesses that we can incubate and spin out of the firm to basically, you know, create some opportunities for other people to found companies that can really help the regulated economy move at a, at a, at a faster pace? Yeah, very interesting. A mandate you both have is is to merge geopolitical and commercial conversations in a way that yields interesting commercial opportunities. And I mean, we're talking about some of those uh, even through the conversation already. But I wonder if there are any additional ideas you might point to in terms of fundamentally new commercial opportunities that are coming about as a result of some of what we've described. What what are some of the interesting ones that pop to mind? Well, I think there's an answer to that on the geopolitical side, and then there's an answer to it on, on the technology side. George, maybe I'll do geopolitics, you do you do technology. I go back to what I said before, Peter, which is you're the same way if you're looking at markets and you see volatility, people are looking at volatility and they see opportunities in different ways to make a commercial play. Volatility obviously is a, is a, is a term with specific meaning, so I'll use uncertainty, but it's the same thing with geopolitical uncertainty. That geopolitical uncertainty is only on the surface about US and China, but is really about a once in a generation reorientation of supply chains, reorientation in where, of where capital is moving and changes in how money and value move around the world. That change is only going to happen once in a generation. It's a huge opportunity for sovereigns and institutions. It's a huge opportunity for businesses. It's a huge opportunity for individuals and you know family offices and investors. You know, it's a huge opportunity for companies from all different sectors and 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 shapes and sizes. So the way to think about this is there's going to be a ton of movement. And whenever there's movement, you know, there's individuals and entities that will gain and then there's individuals and entities that will get left behind. Again, we feel a huge responsibility to our clients to provide differentiated insights into what's happening, not because it's interesting. I mean, it is interesting, but it's meant to, to kind of help guide our clients towards a North Star on how they should be thinking about the forward for their business, how they should be thinking about their own supply chains, how they should be thinking about their workforce, how they should be thinking about where they deploy capital, how they think about the investments that they make, how they think about product fit for a changing macro environment. So these things are all in play. And so to me, the sweet spot is, again, I come back to the fact that we're seeing a shift where when we think about clients of Goldman Sachs, yes, these are commercial relationships. That's part of why they're clients. But what we're really trying to do is build and invest in that intellectual partnership with them as well, because we're going to grapple with these changes together. One confluence that, that strikes me that we've been talking a bit about is the rise of geopolitical swing states in some ways is exemplified by the role, the growing role of India in the world. Its political importance, its demographic tailwinds, its economic growth profile, its role as the world's largest democracy. Also, its ability now to be a bit more individuated in its geopolitical strategies, I think it raises really interesting questions for multinational companies about how to be successful in that unique environment. And there's some, you know, there's some fascinating case studies of what kind of multinational, the type of multinationals that are successful in, in those markets. You know, one small example is, you know, Puma is the dominant supplier of sneakers in India. And Puma is a big, successful company. But, you know, as you go around other countries, that's not generally the hierarchy of, of success in that market. And they've had very unique eccentric strategies in the country that have worked really well. And so as this individuation of markets is heightened by the growing power of geopolitical swing states, the unique corporate strategies for success in these markets, I think is a super interesting thing to inspect and speculate about. Fascinating ideas from you both. Thank you so much. Uh, as the two of you speak with a whole range of clients, uh, in addition, of course, to being leaders of a consequential company uh, yourselves, I wonder where do you, and, I, and forgive me for asking you to sort of boil the ocean a little bit here, but with the level of optimism versus pessimism for the economic mm -hmm. outlook, um, especially here in the US for the rest of 23 and, and into 24, what are, what are some of the things that you're hearing if you could share? Let me step back a little bit. We're clearly in a period, if you go back over the last 30 or 40 years, kind of, you know, all of our collective professional careers, we're clearly in a moment of regime change. While we've had our ups and downs during that 30-year sweep of time, in general, we've been in a period marked by declining interest rates, freer money, greater globalization, more connectivity in, in the world. And by the way, inflation largely under control and not influential in the economic calculus. 
it's unclear how persistent this new environment will be of tighter money, higher interest rates, thorny and potentially sticky inflation, but it's a regime change. And so in those moments, I think it's fascinating to talk to CEOs and boards because it's very hard to call what the trajectory is going to be. And even within Goldman Sachs, you find very divergent views about whether we're going to narrowly avoid a recession in the U.S., whether we're going to dip into a relatively mild recession, how sticky inflation will be. So I think it's a moment of great uncertainty about that trajectory. And then you do have to factor in, this is one of the the really cool things about the work we're doing together, you have to factor in how will the geopolitical and consequential supply chain changes impact that economic picture? How will the rise of technologies like AI, which could have a bit of a deflationary effect to offset some of the inflationary impulses in the economy, how these things will influence that uncertain trajectory. So, you know, I don't have a, I don't have a great answer. I personally, I think we're going to skid by right on the border of a recession in the U.S. But I, I think that the rise of AI is a reminder of the incredible innovative capacity of this country and how when faced with challenge, that innovative capacity is harnessed to allow us to create new vectors of growth and new ways to create new businesses, improve existing businesses. So, you know, I just having been in this this conference over the past couple of days, I feel, you know, slightly more optimistic about our ability to navigate this moment of uncertainty. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, one thing to add to the AI point, it's not like the last chapter of AI wasn't super consequential and important, but it didn't go away. That's it's not like stodgy AI. It's it's still very it's still very significant, right? And so I think what we sort of described as artificial intelligence before the sort of public debut of generative AI and generative AI itself independently will continue to have a huge impact. But where they converge, they're going to have a seismic impact. So I think it's important not to forget all of the incredible things that non-generative AI does. Yeah, the goalposts like, always get pushed back on AI, yeah. Jared, it seems, yeah. right? The progress, the, the remarkable yeah. uh, progress made across the years, and yet everything seems like it's new. Totally. So look, it's. I guess I don't think of things in terms of am I optimistic or am I pessimistic because I come from the world of geopolitics where the world's imperfect and, and it's just a matter of kind of moving chess pieces, right? And so I think we're in a particularly turbulent period right now, but the current pace of the war in Ukraine is not going to sustain for the long haul. At some point, the US-China relationship is either going to come to a head or more likely reach some kind of a stasis. You know, it may heat up again, but I think we're just in the process of, of, of better understanding what the new chessboard looks like, right? And so a good example of this is it doesn't, it's not a useful framework to sort of organize the world into democracies and autocracies in a world where you have these geopolitical swing states, right? You can't call Ukraine the great battle for democracy when the world's largest democracy, you know, is neutral and where you have non-democracies that are part of the sanctions regime or that you need to help reorient the, the supply chains, right? And, and, and the democratic world is not acting as a block. Again, the geopolitical swing states are the evidence of this. So I think that we're in this period right now where until each country can develop a shared understanding of what is happening in the world, the pieces aren't going to settle. And so I think a lot of the turbulence is associated with everybody kind of scrambling to make sense of, of, of the new geopolitical dynamics. This is part of the reason we put out the piece on geopolitical swing states. We think this is a useful framework for understanding the dynamics in the world. And our, our hope is that it will catch on. And we think it's in terms of kind of where you, you have the great power competition that, that's fueling a lot of this. And then, you know, you have pockets of the world that are heavily influenced by that. And then you have geopolitical swing states that themselves will influence it. And it strikes me, Jared, your own experience, both, both uh, in the public and private sector, is one of ongoing engagement, which you know there, there are different different factions that would value more or less that necessity to continue to engage, even in situations where the potential interlocutor is somebody who has different values than you have. As I hear you talking, like the necessity to ensure that we continue to be involved and in the in the arena and in conversation. I, I want to make sure I'm not I'm not stretching or interpreting your 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 thoughts incorrectly, but is that a fair a fair way to, to frame things? It is, but it's also not new, right? So I kind of came of professional age during the war on terror, and there was a very clear distinction between allies and partners. The difference between an ally and a partner is an ally shares your values and a partner shares your interests, 
they, they come with different expectations, right? So what I found when I worked in the Bush administration and the Obama administration is, you know, we would publicly criticize our partners in areas where we didn't share their values and we would lean into the relationship where we shared interests and the art of the statecraft was how well you could engage in that contradictory approach towards your partners without compromising your interests or your values. It's always a very delicate dance and different administrations do it with different degrees of, of, of effectiveness. So, so that construct is still true, but we seem to have forgotten that the world is not made up of Jeffersonian democracies and it's never going to be made up of all Jeffersonian democracies. And at any given time in the world's history, you have democracy on the rise or democracy receding. And it's just kind of a cyclical thing. I think every, everybody's sort of interests are in a global economy working to the extent that there's a lowest common denominator, because I'm not sure the lowest common denominator is in fact global stability. But the lowest common denominator is societies cannot function without a viable economy. Each country puts different constraints on themselves depending on their governance model. But that is something that each country agrees is at least to some extent important, right? And so where I agree with you, I think it's less about just allies and partners in this context and more about, again, leaning into a different kind of relationship with these geopolitical swing states that just they they, they have their own agendas and they have their own leverage to pursue those agendas. George, I wanted to ask you as a, as a former chief information officer, especially in light of the technology aspect of our conversation, what do you mm -hmm. see as the role of your former peers in helping navigate through these trying times for the companies they lead? Look, I think it's an exciting time to be a, a CIO or in a technology leader, because as we talked about earlier, you're hard pressed to find a dimension of any global or local business that doesn't have the potential to be transformed at some level by this innovation. That having been said, whenever these things happen as fast as this is happening, you have to be very careful. There are elements of this technology that are, again, because it's not deterministic, it's emergent. It's programmed to please, and so it has a tendency to confabulate and hallucinate. The deployment of these technologies, while exciting, I think it has to be done in a careful, well-governed, and experimental fashion. And I know certainly operating in a regulated industry the way we do, that's our approach, which is to really try to lean in, but to do it in a way that is experimental, that is um, bounded in its in its impact and reach in the early going and to work closely with regulators and peers and others to find the safest way forward to deploy these technologies. So I think it's, you know, as, as always a little bit of a balance and given the pace of, of development, it's a, it's a harder balance than ever. I think the other thing I would just note is um, one of the more harmful capabilities of this technology. Think about the ability for bad actors to harness these technologies to develop novel attack vectors in the cyber world to create very broad, very large scale, very persuasive phishing attacks to leverage these technologies for large scale misinformation and disinformation campaigns. And so there's going to be an arms race here between bad actors trying to harness this technology for their own aims and the companies that help build detection or remediation platforms that, that combat that. And so I think you have to, while you're excited about the value that, that these technologies can provide to your business, your customers, you have to be deeply aware that the threat vectors are expanding, escalating at the same rate. Well, great. I, the, um, what a fascinating conversation. I really appreciate each of you taking time and enlightening us on the, the, the thoughts you have, but also the conversations you are having with many consequential organizations that make up Goldman Sachs a customer, a customer list. Uh, it, it's been an intriguing conversation, one that uh, produces more questions than, than answers in some cases because there is so much that's unknowable. But in the, the weeks, uh, it's amazing to think that it's probably, you know, we're weeks away, months away from, from new revelations as to where this will continue to go. And for that reason, among others, I'll look forward to staying uh, closely in touch with the two of you with your evolving thinking as well. George, Jared, thank you so much for joining us today.